Hey everyone, it's Michelle DeVries with Metaphysical Mining. Episode one is finally here. My guest is Sherry Sweeney. She's co-author of the book, An Amazing Journey into the Psychotic Mind, Breaking the Spell of the Ivory Tower. It is a fascinating dive into the world of schizophrenia and how Sherry and her co-author Jerry Marzinski discovered that the voices heard by patients are not hallucinations, but instead real conscious parasitic entities. Even though Sherry's background is in construction engineering, she's more than qualified to discuss this topic. As you'll hear, Sherry has had a lifelong interaction with the hidden predator that I write about in my thesis paper. In fact, she's been battling predatory voices since the tender age of three. Her story is tragic, gripping, and truly inspiring. On a side note, we do go a tad off topic at one point towards the end when she discusses working as a civilian for the Navy at age 19, but I left it in because it shows just how truly intelligent and perceptive she is. So, you know, this hidden predator certainly had his hands full with this one. All right, that's enough. Let's get on with it. We are officially recording episode one of the Metaphysical Mining channel. It is Sunday, February 20th, 2022. My name is Michelle DeVries and my guest is Sherry Sweeney. Welcome to Metaphysical Mining. Thank you for inviting me, Michelle. I really appreciate you taking the time to read the paper and speak with me today. Just let everybody know that before we hit record, I was explaining to Sherry how I wanted this channel to play out. Like what was my aspirations? What were my intentions with this channel? This is basically a supplement to my academic research. I was awarded my master's degree in metaphysical science in December of 2021. So just a couple months ago. And I established this channel to speak with people like Sherry, authors and researchers that I featured in my review of literature chapter within the paper. And here are the resources that I used. This is Sherry Sweeney's book that she co-authored with Jerry Marzinski. It's an amazing journey into the psychotic mind, breaking the spell of the ivory tower. And then to the right is her website, which is keyholejourney.wordpress.com. I will put the links for everything in the show notes. We're going to get into some of the quotes in the book that I used, as well as I'm going to read a passage from her blog. But before that, I something else that I shared with Sherry is something that happened this morning while I was drinking my coffee and I was getting prepared, you know, mentally prepared for the show. Not only am I working on a project like this channel, I have other projects on the side that I decided to focus on this year. One of them is learning how to be proficient in a tarot deck that was created by Josephine McCarthy. The Quoria deck, here's the book that supplements the deck. So I'm drinking my coffee this morning, I'm shuffling the cards. And I said, you know, I just want one card that will encapsulate the show that we're going to do, it's going to represent the person that I'm going to be interviewing, just kind of set the tone for the show itself. Give me some inspiration. And the card that's supposed to represent the show and Sherry is the Wheel of Fate. I am going to read quickly the description within the book that describes this Wheel of Fate. All right, here we go. As the Wheel of Fate turns, it burns up old outmoded patterns and illuminates the new path ahead. This power sits close to humanity and manifestation and is involved with the changing tides of fate of all living things. As the power of change flows through the inner desert, the wheel turns and gives that change the momentum necessary to break the present stasis and prepare for whatever new allocations are to be put in place by the three fates. The wheel of fate is connected to the chariot. They are both powers that rise out of the earth and bring change. The wheel is concerned with the fate patterns of living humans. It brings change that enables a person's fate to progress. The appearance of this card heralds a major change for the magician or for the reading's subjects, which would be Sherry. When this card appears, do not fear the change or fight it. It is a necessary part of your development and maturation. Embrace the change and be open to engaging actively with this power to learn and grow. That's a pretty 
powerful card that we were just talking about before we hit record that I'm going to leave this card up because I want everybody to keep that description top of mind, keep this card top of mind as I read from her blog. And I decided to introduce Sherry in this way because she's way more than just a paragraph of a bio. And that, that's not to throw shade at other shows that do that, but this show is different. This show is drilling down into who these people are that I used in my paper. Why did I use them? And when I read this, it's going to show you the journey that I went on because this is the story that got me to use Sherry's information in my paper. You guys are going to see what I actually read. And at the end, I, I just, I knew, I knew that her information had to be included. And I knew that I had to interview her someday. This is from July 21st, 2016. And Sherry has not heard this in a while. This is story time with okay. Michelle and metaphysical mining. <laughs> All right, here we go. Sherry, you wrote, I think the best way to explain how I was able to send away the negative spirits that plagued me for years is to tell you a story. It begins some 40 years ago after I'd already spent years researching the brain to learn what was wrong with me and how to fix it. My initial, my initial research centered on conventional science. What I learned about the mechanics of the brain was interesting, but didn't help much as it only dealt with the material world. The voices that haunted me were not of that world. All right. I love the story already. All right. This, <laughs> the story begins with a friend of mine. The story begins when a friend of mine was going on a trip around the world and would be gone for four months. She invited me to house sit for her and babysit her Yorkshire Terrier. I jumped at the chance to live in a beautiful home in Mill Valley, California, secluded from everyone else in San Francisco. At that time, I was struggling with how to forgive my ex and his new wife for taking my children from me and then poisoning their minds against me. This seclusion was a perfect opportunity for that effort. The day after I moved in and said bon voyage to my friend, I went to a bookstore to browse around with when a book fell off the shelf, landing at my feet. Wheel of fate. <laughs> I picked it up to put it back on the shelf, but first I flipped through its pages. Seriously, you're going to be floored by the end of this. So it was Wayne Dyer. It was by Wayne Dyer called Your Erroneous Zones. I took it to the bookstore coffee shop to browse through before deciding whether to buy it or not and opened it to a random page, which read, no one can make you feel good or bad. That is your choice. You have the ability to control your thoughts and only you can make yourself happy. I closed the book and whispered, oh my God, I did not know that. That was a pivotal moment for me that changed the course of my life. I took the book back to my, I'm getting the goosebumps by the way. So I took the book back to my friend's house and began reading every page. Many times I put it down to observe my thoughts. I've done that so many times myself. I wondered who is it observing my thoughts? What are thoughts? Where do thoughts come from? Where do thoughts go once we think them? How do I control them if I'm able to step back and watch them appear out of nowhere, realizing they are not coming from me, the watcher? Very good questions. At the end of the four months, my friend returned from her world tour. She and I had a lot to discuss. First, she had to show me all her slides of places she visited and people she met. She looked vibrant and happy. At supper, I told her about the book. Did you know that you can control your thoughts and that no one can make you feel one way or another unless you allow it, I asked. She did not know this either. And though her childhood had been quite normal, she loved the idea. She asked if I would leave the book with her. As I drove back to San Francisco to find a new apartment, I continued having revelations about my own mind. In my apartment, I spent time alone plowing through many texts about the brain and mind before I came across a book by Robert Monroe called Journeys Out of the Body. I practiced some of the exercises the book rec recommended. They didn't cause me to travel out of my body, but did have another astounding effect. I began to see flashes of memory from the past 13 years of my life, which I had previously had no recall. I didn't understand them at first until a floodgate opened and all the memories rushed in suddenly. I was overwhelmed and could not believe the things I was remembering. 
I felt like a deer in the headlights, understanding but too horrified to process everything all at once. Flashes of my father being enamored with Japanese torture methods and using me as his lab rat from age three to six surged into my mind. Glimpses of spending six months in a juvenile detention center at age six and a half and spending two weeks in solitary confinement appeared. I just got the goosebumps big time. So finally flickers of spending five years in a Catholic orphanage where I and 500 other girls suffered stunning emotional and physical abuse until I was released at age 13. Jesus. All right, give me a minute here. <clears throat> okay. Astonished by these memories that were coming up, I sat in the middle of my living room like a stone sculpture. When the movie of memories stopped, I whispered to the empty room, that's what's wrong. I got brainwashed. What do I do now? The memory dump revealed that I was mind controlled through physical and emotional torture. What was so strange is that after the age of 13, my memories of my father are great. He taught me to hunt and fish and to be self-sufficient in the wilderness. He taught me advanced mathematics and so much more. I grew up loving math and science. It seemed natural that I would study civil engineering as a career path. From everything I had read, I realized that early childhood experiences are embedded in the subconscious as truth. My subconscious truth was first, you get tortured by a man, and then the man treats your cuts, bruises, and wounds, and then the man cuddles you and rocks you to sleep, and then you feel loved and safe again. This was exactly the scenario I had been playing out in my life without ever knowing why. Never would I have understood this had that dam not broken wide open when it did. And for that, I am grateful. On the top of that, on top of that conditioned behavior, the voices kept telling me I was worthless in this world. But now with my memory returning, I knew differently. I knew that the horrible things that were done to me were not things I had caused, chosen, or deserved. So not only did I need to figure out how to overcome being brainwashed to fix my mind, I needed to find out how to get rid of the voices that plagued me and continued to tell me horrible things about myself. When I got back to work after the weekend, my boss called me into his office. Sherry, he said, how would you like to learn computer programming? I said, sounds interesting. What's going on? He leaned back in his chair. We just got awarded a contract to develop a computerized tracking system for a major water district. I thought you would be the best candidate to head up the project. Sure, I said, I'd love the challenge. When do we start? Tomorrow, he said. Over the next few months, I learned computer programming. 15 months later, I had written the computer code for the water district's tracking system, and they loved it. Awesome job, Sherry. More than that, I saw a remarkable similarity between how computers process information and how our brains process information, each running on a program that is inserted by an outside programmer. Very important. While the computer program operates by its software code, the brain program operates by electrical impulses traveling specific synaptic paths. I wondered if I could write a mental program that would not only tackle the negative thoughts, i.e. the voices that were hounding me, but also eliminate or deprogram the brainwashed conditioning that was exacerbating the misery in my life. My theory was to write a mental program. Again, the wheel of fate is turning and train myself to use that new program more than the existing one until the new program became automatic in the existing program atrophied, weakened to the point it could no longer perform even if you tried. In other words, rewire my brain. I first tried to edit the code in my brain, but it didn't work. It was too, way too complicated to remember while in the throes of unconscious conditioning, responses set off by life events or during Archon attacks. I needed to think of something easier, something I could remember while in the midst of older programming being triggered by the world around me. I now knew that all the negative things I had been taught about myself by, by my parents, the juvenile detention center, the Catholic orphanage, public schools, and society in general with regard to who I really was, was not true. It was all lies. I was not a bad and evil person destined to go to hell. 
I was not a crazy person. I was not a selfish person. I did not hate myself or anyone else. I was not born to hate life, nor was I born to sin. I was not stupid going at nowhere. I was not a bad mother. None of these things were true. And yet prior to running the new program, I heard this as truth by the voices and felt this as true by the mental conditioning all day and all night long. Because of that, I had been bewildered, surprised in the faces and eyes of others as I watched myself overreacting to their innocent words and walking away in embarrassment. All I could do was cringe at my overreactions later when I was alone. I vowed that if it took me my whole life, I would find a way to fix this. After some trial and error, I designed a mental program called That's a Lie. I actually have Wayne Dyer to thank for initially setting me on the right track by pointing out that we do have a choice about the way we think. In other words, we have the ability to take control over our own mind. I also give credit to, and many thanks to the universe for the synchronicity of dropping Wayne's book at my feet and opening the door that allowed me to learn computer programming. The wheel of fate turns again. It was exactly what I needed to get started on the path toward fixing the root problem so that I could begin to heal. Couple more pages. The That's a Lie program worked perfectly on eliminating the brainwashed conditioning, allowing me the mental space I required to become who I wanted to be instead of mindlessly being what others programmed into me. My theory had worked. Once I broke through and conquered the brainwashing effects, I was surprised, surprised to find that much of what had been forcefully programmed into my brain as a child was still being utilized by the spirit parasites against me. I was still receiving negative thoughts and messages, which sounded exactly like my own thoughts. The prodding and poking, the suggestions, even demands coming from them were beyond anything I could imagine thinking, much less doing. If these thoughts were not coming for me and I could sit back and watch them flow through me and feel disgusted by them, then they were from an outside source. Researching this, I learned about the archons of ancient times. And I'm going to read a quote that she has from a text. In 1947, texts were found in clay jars in Nag Hammadi in Egypt. And on these texts was the story of what the Nag Hammadi people 2000 years ago thought the world was about. In Gnostic belief, archons were planetary rulers and guardians of the spiritual planes. The archons were associated with the seven invisible planets and perceived as ancient agents of the demiurge, predatory beings who inhabit spiritual awakening by convincing humanity of a false reality, forces of sin and temptation. They influence the way you perceive the world, not the world itself. Very important. The primary power in the world we inhabit is the indwelling divinity of the planet, the Gaian intelligence called Sophia by the Gnostics. If you are aligned to the Gaian intelligence, you do not see the world as a place of fear and predation, but of beauty, bounty, and magic. Reading this confirmed that I was not losing my mind, but instead being attacked by negative parasitic beings that are very real. Now it was time to apply the new program to see if it would work on the archon slash demon voices that just would not leave me alone. Once I actually applied the principles and stuck to them, the program worked just as effectively on them as it did on the brainwashing. Incredible. In essence, this program denies the entities their battle. You are armed with the truth that these parasites tell lies about who you are. Lots of them. By not engaging and, and denying them the battle, you are not generating any food for them. They must have negative energy to survive. They cannot generate it themselves. They have no power or of their own. They cannot evoke negative emotions from you. They have no choice but to leave or starve to death. If you are persistent, they have to leave. Here's how I worked the That's the Lie program. Every time I caught myself having a knee-jerk overreaction to a thought or feeling, I would say, that's a lie. An example, one of many, someone might say, you are just a stupid idiot. Instead of allowing the old program to run, that would cause me to agree and feel low self-esteem or get angry about what the person said. I would consciously run the new program and say to myself, that's a lie. 
My logical mind already knew I was not stupid, but my subconscious mind needed the new program to be repeatedly run in order to create new neural pathways in a different recording. How in the world could I work as a civil engineer and run an international human rights organization and run my life in spite of all the stuff that had happened to me if I were stupid? Exactly. The messages these entities were inserting into my mind were insane. The truth, I love this part, the truth, this is the last paragraph. The truth is that each of us is born as a pure being, each with a pure and sovereign spirit, each with the potential to live a happy, productive, healthy, and prosperous life. By the time the world gets through with us, running us through the mill and negatively programming us, we forget all that. For some of us, the process is torturous, as was mine. For others, the process is like every day, hearing and seeing. Witnessing people say and do things that are nasty, egotistical, and completely contrary to the flesh. Thus, our subconscious records these things as truth when it is all lies. With our perception of the world influenced by these lies, we become the perfect feeding ground for these parasites to infest. I mean, as soon as I read that, I was like, that's it. She's in the paper. There's no question. Yeah, well, I, th I think uh, I think that says it all. So <laughs> we can be done. <laughs> yeah, we can be all done. <laughs> I'm telling you, that was, it was just, let me stop sharing here. I mean, did you see, before I do, did you see the wheel of fate everywhere yes. in that? And let me just stop share for a second so we can catch our bearings here from that. I'm going to take a sip of some water. What, what were your thoughts? Because you haven't heard that in a while, have you? No, I haven't. I've, I've sent a lot of people to, to read it. I think the mm -hmm. title of that is the, that's the lie program, isn't it? Yes, it yeah. is. It is. Yeah. And like I said, it's from July 21st, 2016. If anybody wants to write that down and, but I'll put it in the show notes, but yeah, that's the, that's the lie program. Yeah. And then, and then shortly after that, I did an interview with James Bartley and there were a lot of questions. So I wrote a part two to okay. that. I, I think I called it, that's a lie update. Anyway, I should have called it part two, but, and so I went into the, the mechanics of how the subconscious works. And I got that work from Bruce Lipton, Dr. Bruce okay. Lipton. Who, who's Which here. that's really synchronistic because I use Bruce in the beginning, in the introduction of the paper. I noticed um, that. Yeah. yeah noticed this blows my mind, this kind of stuff, because the universe guides you just like that book fell on your feet. Absolutely. It, it will do stuff like that. If you are mature enough to witness it and then act on it. You, you can't be dismissive of stuff like that. Yeah, the, the synchronicities are sometimes subtle and you might miss them if you're not looking for them. But if you are, if you want something, or you, you have a deep, deep desire to do something, especially when it's in, to improve yourself or to improve the life of others or to just improve life on earth, then the synchronicities are abundant. They're everywhere you turn and if you don't notice them, well, you, you know, there'll be more, but you have to notice them to act on them. So that's what's happening here, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, you all of a sudden contacted us from my website and from Jerry's website. And then I opened up your, your paper and read it. And I thought, oh, okay, well, she's really on the right page. You know, she's really, <laughs> you know, this is wonderful. And then yeah. when you invited me to talk to you, on your show I was like wow okay this is delightful yeah yeah well this is the first show so this is a great kickoff oh. I'm excited <laughs> yeah 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 well so I read I had studied been studying Bruce Lipton for some time mm -hmm. so when I when I was asked all these questions or when I was interviewing with James I thought well okay I'm gonna write a part two to this to explain it to those people uh, and I used a lot of Bruce Lipton's work to mm -hmm. explain how how he describes subconscious works. I put it in my own words. Mm -hmm. I think I quoted him a couple of times, but I put it basically in my own words from my own understanding. Because <laughs> when you're learning something, if you can't repeat, if you can't explain what you've learned, then you haven't learned it. Yeah, exactly. So I needed to do this in my words and, you know, so that it, it conveyed his, his whole realm of research. He's a remarkable man. And if anybody has not become familiar with Dr. Bruce Lipton, I highly recommend his, his going to his website. And I think I have a link in part two to his website yep. so that you can start. But basically he's talking about how the subconscious 
works and how the mind works when we're first born. Yeah. Where we're in the theta state, which is a, a kind of a hypnagogic state. It's like a hypnotic state until mm -hmm. we're about six or seven years old. So what, hap what, what we're doing in order to learn how to survive our surroundings we're picking up on everything that everybody does. We're, we may not understand their words. We may not understand their actions, but we're picking it all up and we're taking it into our subconscious as though it's the truth. Right. When I relate that back to my young life and what I experienced, my, my earliest memory is age three, you know, torture and abuse and torture and abuse and terrible things and being called all kinds of really degradative names. Mm -hmm. And so I just took that all in is, okay, well, that must be the way things are. You know, that's the way life is. And I didn't particularly like it or dislike it at the time because I was too young to articulate it. Yeah. And, and I want to stop you there because I want the audience to appreciate what you just said. I think that other interviews, they gloss over that because of time constraints and stuff like that. I'm not trying to be jerk when I say that, but I want to focus in on that. You started interacting with this predatory archetype at the age of three yeah. and you were programmed by what I call sink or swim in the paper mm -hmm. rules of engagement where you were forced to battle with this predator at a very very young age mm -hmm. and I think that what's so different and spectacular about that is that if you look at Jerry's work Jerry Marzinski is a psychotherapist. He's dealing with grown men and women who cannot even handle dealing with this predatory archetype. Yet here is Sherry Sweeney at three, between three and six years old, <laughs> holding her own uh, in the predator's dojo on his mat with him, wrestling with this archetype. But there's grown men and women to this day who can't hang when it comes to it. I, I really want people to understand that your experience is that rich and you have that much authority when you speak about this because it's been your whole life and it literally shaped you as a person. This archetype is yeah. responsible for shaping you. And so I did want to ask, because I don't think I've ever heard anyone ask this question. Why do you feel your father was interested in torture methods? Was it something that was within the family? Was there abuse within the family or was this new and it just started with him? We were we were just ending World War II when I was born. Okay. And uh, because I was born in 1944, so, and World War II ended in 45, 46. And so um, I don't know what caused him specifically to be enamored with chi Japanese torture, but yeah. I know that his family side escaped the Bolshevik Revolution. They came across the ocean and landed here in, in Ellis Island, <laughs> of all places. Yeah. <laughs> so, and they, my grandmother and grandfather met there and married and then had my father and his brother. Okay. And so for whatever reason, he became really, really interested in how the Japanese got information from people and how they controlled people. So he was, uh, he was an excellent dog trainer. I remember that we, at the time, I think we had three dogs, three different breeds of dogs, and he, he never abused them, mm -hmm. but he trained them uh, really beautifully. And, uh, and then I guess he decided to train me to see gotcha. how I would react to the torture methods. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, being a child, I think all children love their parents when they're small they don't you know they just love them they're just mm -hmm. they're just connected to them there's a bond and so I remember my father asking he said I want to do an experiment will you help me and I was like all oh, excited yeah, yeah sure I'd love to help you sure daddy you know that sounds mm -hmm. great I had no idea what I was getting into so we we went into the kitchen and he put on his lab coat and he got his his clipboard uh, and you know and I was just watching him because I had no idea what was going on and the very first experiment was, he said, this is going to be an easy one. I just want to test you and see how, how you'll do. I said, okay. And so what it was, here I am three years old. He had me put my arms out to the side with my palms up and he put a glass of water in each palm. Okay. And they were pretty full. They weren't filled to the brim, but they were like, you know, regular filled glasses. They were mm -hmm. 
they were not big glasses, but they were, you know, maybe juice glasses. Mm -hmm. And he said, so I want you to hold those out there and don't spill a drop because if you do, then the consequences are going to be very, very bad. And I didn't know what that meant, but it scared me mm -hmm. uh, because he was a big guy. He was six foot four. <laughs> so, oh, wow. <laughs> and so I, I, I said, okay. So I put my arms out and he put a glass of water in each palm of my hand and I'm holding them out. And I wish I were on video now because that's what I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But so I'm holding the glasses and my arms were getting heavier and heavier and heavier. And you can imagine I'm three years old. I mean, old. yeah, you're three years old. Yeah. I'm three years old. I'm supposed to balance these glasses without spilling a drop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was afraid of that. I was watching them and making sure I wasn't spilling anything. And then my arms started getting really super heavy. Mm -hmm. And then I said, can I put them down now? Because my arms are getting heavy. He said, no, no, no. Just wait a bit. And he wrote something on his clipboard. And then... And so then my arms really were starting to be very painful, really, really hurting. And so I started to cry mm -hmm. because they hurt so much. Yeah. And so I, I was crying and saying, you know, can I put my hands down now, mm -hmm. please? And he said, no, just, just a few minutes, just hold them there until I tell you to stop. So I really started getting scared because I was afraid of those consequences, even though he didn't tell me what they were. Yeah. And, uh, and then I started really crying hard and then I started screaming and finally he lifted the glasses up and my arms fell down and I was just, I just sat there and sobbed and he was, did, he was dutifully writing notes down. He didn't do anything to console me or anything like that. He was just observing what was going on. That was wow. the first day. <laughs> wow. So then the next day, he said, are you ready for another experiment? And I said, no. No. I don't, I don't You're like, no. No, I don't want to do yeah. that. No, he said, we won't do that one. I promise you. So wait, so he didn't even explain what that was all about? No. Great. Okay. No. I still, to this day, don't know what that was about. Jeez. All right. I don't even know what. Because I mean, at about. least if you understood, you could kind of understand the game, you know? It's like, you yeah. know, kids playing games. You want to be the strongest type of thing. You could like look at it in a positive way. So. Let's see how much you can take, right? Yeah. Or something yeah. like that. But no, he, he didn't do that. Not that I remember. Okay. So then the next day he asked me if I wanted to do it again. I said, no. And he said, well, I promise we won't do that one. And I said, okay. So we went into the kitchen and he sat me down on the chair this time. Mm -hmm. And he got his clipboard and his lab coat. And I wasn't thinking anything was weird about the lab coat at the time. But when I look back, I think it was very, very weird. Very strange. <laughs> yeah, It's almost like he was programming you with that authority. The lab right. coat, people look at a lab coat as an archetype itself. Oh, you know? sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, like it's the, the Western archetype for medicine. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He had the air of medicine, mm -hmm. laboratory. Even yep. though it was in our kitchen, it had the air of that, the feel of that. And so then he he had a soldering iron being heated up in the, the gas stove, in the in the one of the burners of the gas stove, and it was just sitting there heating up. And I didn't notice it right off the bat until mm -hmm. I started smelling it because it started getting super red hot. Yeah. And then he said, you know, put your hands on the table and spread your fingers out so I did like no <laughs> no I did because I uh -huh. didn't see the iron I didn't yeah. see the iron. okay I still have scars on my thumbs from where he touched me after all these years mm -hmm. with that hot iron and I screamed my head off and he just said you have to sit there and be still you have to take this and I said no <laughs> oh and he God. said you better just sit there and take it oh. or else and that or else made me stay yeah yeah. Yeah. When you hear that from a parent, you don't, yeah. you don't want to know what that is. No, I didn't know what, want yeah. to know what it was. And I yeah. was really, really afraid, but I, because if I'm getting this, this type of behavior is occurring and the or else is or worse. else is going to be worse. So, yeah. you know. yeah. so that's kind of the way it built up over time. And then he didn't do it every day. He did it a couple of days and then he'd give it a break and then he'd do, go back again and do it again. So this went on until I was about six and a half years old. But in between, in between, my sister and I would go to bed. We slept in, we shared the room. 
And then my father would come in and he would pull me out of bed, out of, just out of a sound sleep. Mm -hmm. He would grab a hold of my shoulder and walk me over to a big chair in the living room. Mm -hmm. It's a big wooden chair. I'll never forget. It was a beautiful maple or oak chair. It was a really pretty chair. And so I would sit in the chair and then he would sit on the couch and he would start reading some of his books. And most of them were about mathematics or architecture or history and not not regular history it was like actually it was metaphysical history that he was okay. reading and so what my job was was to sit there and pay attention and don't fall asleep oh geez so, so that's I was, not gonna happen <laughs> that's when the, that's when the voices really attacked me mm -hmm. and I wrote about this in the book I wrote yes. about one, one of the sessions in the book Okay. where I was scrambling with it and, and I made a game of it because at one point and I think I put this part in the book too at one point I was staring at my father and because I was staring at him I turned his head I made his head shrink yes I remember this you made it shrink into an orange right an or yeah I called yes. it an orange, an orange head and that was yes. <laughs> that was the way you could stay awake right was to yeah. use your yeah. imagination yeah. to focus on something that would be fun. That's your instinct and your intuition. Yeah. What I talk about in the paper, where mm -hmm. the, the theory that I have in the paper is that you have to have a certain level of maturity in order to switch on this survival mechanism that helps you to battle this predator successfully. And I, I like that, that you, know, you were a young age, because when I say, and I'm not saying that, I like that this happened to you. I'm just saying because of the age that you were, because when I say maturity, I don't mean age, like human age maturity. I mean that you probably came into this lifetime with that level of maturity, which is why at this young age, you could switch on that type of imagination where it protected you mm -hmm. um, versus these people that Jerry worked with. They're adults. They're 30, 40, 50 years old, and they can't hack it. Yet you were able to adapt and evolve with this type of behavior. And I think that really shows you had this universal, almost cosmic maturity when you came into this body. It's almost like you were prepared for this fate that you were born into. I never that thought about sense? it that way. It does make sense, but I never thought about it that way. I do recall... Uh after one of these long reading sessions, th that was the, the, the night that I got thrown across the room for yelling at the voices. And my dad interpreted that as me yelling at him. Yes. Because yes. I, I, I thought I was yelling from inside, but I was actually yelling. You outside. were using your outside <laughs> voice, not your inside but, voice. Yeah, yeah, you were yeah, that, so tired. That was you a mistake. You realize it, you know? Yeah, 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 probably so. That was a big mistake because I ended up across the room and then he sent me off to bed. And I, I remember sitting on my bedroom floor and I was looking out, I just recently wrote a blog about this too. I, I was sitting looking out the window and the only light was the moon. And I remember thinking, I don't want to do this again. And I, I meant this life, this yeah. life experience again. I don't want to mm -hmm. do this again. Yep. So I had my mind made up. I didn't want to do this again. But yeah. yet here I was in this situation anyway. And, there, you know, as a child, you can't just get out of that situation. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's perfectly goes along with, you didn't want to do this, but you came in guns blazing. You yeah. came in with this, this memory and, you know, I'm kind of getting into my PhD research now, but, but I really feel that you're epigenetically, we'll use a Dr. Bruce Lipton term when mm -hmm. you epigenetically trigger DNA that has the gifts and talents that you can use to survive. This is a perfect example of it. You tapped into this DNA that your ancestors passed on to you. Somebody within your DNA line perfected battling this predator and they hid that knowledge in your genes. And it's just sitting there waiting. It's waiting for that mature individual who has the authority. You have to have the authority to switch this on. And then once you switch it on, watch out, you get all the gifts and the talents that you need to battle whatever it is that comes at you. And that's exactly what I saw 
with you and with Jerry and with Paul, you all had a different moment where I saw that switch was flipped. In your blog, in that story, you flipped that switch. And then Jerry, he did his a different way. Paul Eno did his in seminary school. So that's why I chose the three of you because I could literally see you saying it in your material. And that's what I included in the paper was that aha moment that all three of you had. And you guys are textbook examples of having the authority and the permission from your ancestral line to use these talents and gifts because not everybody gets access to them. And Jerry Marzinski's work, when I talk to him, I'm going to talk about that. Most of his patients, they don't have access to those gifts and talents because they don't have the maturity level. They have to live through not having those gifts in order to be able to get access to them, maybe in another lifetime. I don't really, you know, I don't know everything, but for you being able to do this at what, three, four, five, just anything below the age of 18, in my opinion, is miraculous. So bravo, hats off to you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't suppose I would have survived otherwise. Yeah. No, you yeah. probably wouldn't. No, I mean, that- because there, there, I had moments, I had several moments where I felt like I had, I was so tired of battling. I was really right. exhausted battling. And, and I remember I had the thought planted in my brain from, from the, I call them voices, but they weren't audible voices. <laughs> they were just really like telepathic, intrusive. like telepathic. Yeah, they were telepathic of, yeah. thoughts and they yeah. were very, very intrusive. They yeah. were obviously not coming from me. And I knew that. And I remember Jerry saying, well, how did you know they weren't from you? And I said, I don't know. I just knew. At what age did you first hear those voices? Did oh, what age five? did I first hear? Yeah. Oh, gosh. I, you know, I'm not really sure. I kind of think I've been hearing them all along, but, you know, maybe I wasn't aware of it. I think I was five. I remember going out into the living room and my father was there and, and my stepmother was there. And I think they had some visitors over. And I, I walked out into the living room and I said, I have a question. And I think I addressed it to my dad because he had been talking about, he, I remember him asking me the question, have you ever thought that what you dream is your real life and what you're living now is just a dream? Mm-hmm. And here I was five years old, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I'm like, no, I never thought of that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Why would I think of that? You know, yeah. so. Anyway, but I, I, I guess that kicked off some thoughts. And so mm-hmm. I, were, I wondered where thoughts came from because I was getting bombarded by thoughts that weren't mine. And I wondered where they came from. Well, when I put the question out, I said, you know, where do thoughts come from? And then I wanted to know, well, what do they do after we think about them? I mean, are they, are, you know, do they still go on and think them, think themselves or do what, mm-hmm. what happens to them after you think them? Yeah. I still don't know the answer to that one, but yeah. I've always imagined that having asked that question, where do thoughts, what happens to thoughts after, after you think them, where do they go? What do they do? You know, are they still active? And I believe they are still active because they're, they're energy. Mm-hmm. And so they, they stay in you and they leave you at the same time and they create, they take with them the energy that is with that thought. If it's a mild thought or if it's a huge thought, or if it's a thought filled with emotion you know, it goes out into the universe and then it, it goes wherever it goes. It affects the whole earth, actually. Yeah, it just like yeah. goes out into the ether. Yeah, to say that to some people, they might think that's a grandiose thought, mm-hmm. thinking that your little thought can change the world. Well, but everybody has little thoughts all the time. Yes. And if those thoughts are in sync, it's going to change the world. Yes. Or it's going to change the perception of the world because these, whether they're archons or whether they're aggregores or whatever they are, Mm -hmm. I know that they're real. I know that they exist. I know that they have a consciousness. They, they are masters at manipulating perception. Yes. So how we perceive ourselves and how we perceive the world you know, we have to know what's in our own mind. We have to know the difference between somebody else's thought and our own thoughts. Because most of the thoughts we've ever received in our entire life have come from somebody else. Yes, exactly. Think about Very it. good point. Mm-hmm. If you think about it, everything that we've ever received in our whole lives is coming from elsewhere. 
Yes, it's, it's been passed from... along and we've adopted yes. it and we thought yes. it was ours. Yeah. 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 And I always it... say, I'm not inventing the wheel here. I'm just showing you with my paper, I read these books and I see the pattern. Mm-hmm. That's it. Because exactly. this is the story as old as time. Mm-hmm. And this would be a good lead into those slides that I have because some people that are listening that haven't read the paper, that maybe haven't read you know, the book that you co-authored with Jerry, maybe they're kind of wondering what the heck are these ladies talking about? What is this parasite? Is it a predator? Is it an girl? Let me go to the slides. And this is her book that Sherry co-wrote with Jerry. The story that I read was this to the right was the blog at this keyholejourney.wordpress.com. So I'm going to go into defining some terms. Okay. And, and the reason why we're having this conversation, I, I started this channel was because it's a supplement to my master's thesis paper. And the title of that paper is The Hidden Predator Deconstructing the Shadow Side of Reality. We've been talking about this hidden predator the whole time. So this is just a quick overview for people that haven't read the paper yet. We can all be on the same page from this point going forward, but this is my actual thesis statement. I'm going to read it quickly. This thesis will reveal the subtle predatory ruling intelligence embedded within the fabric of our reality and how humanity interacts with it, often with dangerous and even deadly consequences. I'll prove that just becoming aware of the shadow archetype of reality can be a catalyst for an evolutionary growth process of the mind, ushering humanity into another plateau of awareness. And then I finished with saying that once you stand on this higher plateau, contrary to what most people believe, you will become aware of a very different paradigm. You'll go through a paradigm shift, hopefully. And then one in which humans are not at the top of the food chain. And the reason why I bolded and put that one sentence in in green is because that is what we were just talking about with Sherry. That research and her story is within part two of the review of literature where I go into how this predator can be a catalyst for an evolutionary growth process and how and showcase what Sherry was just talking about, how she was forced into look at the world from a different, you know, perspective. She had a paradigm shift at a very young age and had to evolve in order to survive is essentially what you had to do. And Mm -hmm. there's a term in the discussion section that I call kaleidoscoping. You're a perfect example of that. You were forced to expand your awareness and your awareness had to not only look at the physical world, you had to then penetrate into the metaphysical world. And you had to interact with your metaphysical surroundings, which is where this predator lurks. And that was the ancestral tools and gifts that you tapped into. So let's define what this hidden predator means. This is my definition. And then I'll have Sherry talk about her definition. So the hidden predator in the paper is an independent, invisible, non-material, non-human, ancient predatory race. This is a completely different race of being that shares our planet, lives in a parallel reality and exhibits a high degree of social and psychological agency. In the paper, I also go through a hierarchy and we probably won't be able to get into this, but it has defined rules of engagement. And with all that, once you read all the review of literature and the discussion, you'll see that this predator is governed by laws that appear to supersede our human laws. Interaction with them is on their terms, not ours. And you can see that in part one of the review of literature, where I show how they can easily take humans from our reality to theirs. They physically come and go as they please, and they literally take us as they please, back and forth. And sometimes they don't bring us back. So, so that's basically what a hidden predator is in a nutshell. It's way more than that. But Sherry, do you agree with all of that so far? And maybe- yeah, you say they live in a parallel reality. I, I believe they do. I think that parallel reality is more of a frequency. Yeah. They live in a different frequency that we can't see because our visual spectrum is quite narrow in yeah. the whole spectrum of light. So I, yeah. I, I think that they... I've thought about this a lot and I can't prove it, but I think that they live in a different frequency than ours. That's why we can't see them. Once in a while, they will, they will be able to manifest themselves in the form of smoke or dust or something that's still not 
tangible, still not. Which you're describing can. a time storm, right? <laughs> the what? I said, you're basically describing a time storm. What Janie Randalls wrote about in the book, Time Storms, that I use in the first part of the, the paper. It's like a fog or a mist. Um, yeah, I had or- an experience with one of them when I was an adult. And I was doing a Reiki practice with a group of women around the world. This was when I was running the International Human Rights Organization. We were concentrating on prisons in the United States. We were picking one prison at a time, and we had an inmate on the inside who we had befriended Mm -hmm. and who was very interested in making things a little bit better inside because the the prisons, as, as some people don't even know, they're not just, you know, three hots in a cot. They are very, very dangerous uh, places to be. Mm -hmm. And they're full of gangs, they're full of drugs, they're full of crime, there are murders in there, there's beatings in there. And that's not only by the inmates, it's by the guards as well. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to see if, if if we focused our Reiki energy to one prison for an evening, if that would have any effect at all on how the environment changed inside that one prison Mm -hmm. that's interesting it was an interesting experiment we had all women that were around the world and we would set up a particular time that we would gather we were all gathered at the same moment in time Mm -hmm. and we would start our reiki energy projections to that particular prison and then we would wait until the inmate would write to us and tell us what he observed oh wow and so we were actually having some noticeable effects where the guards were being more polite. The gangs were not fighting as much. The food was actually a little bit better. Mm -hmm. The medications were a little bit uh, more on time. You know, the restrictions weren't let up, but, but it was a little bit easier. It was a little bit smoother inside. We thought if that worked for one session, what would it do if we could do this every day? You know, mm-hmm. what yeah. would that do? <clears throat> well, we didn't get a chance to do that because there were too many prisons, but yeah. because doing it with one was, you know, maybe a fluke, right? So we mm-hmm. had to do it several times. We did it with five or six prisons and they all had similar results. Wow. We know that sending... Uh, Reiki energy into a particular prison has an effect. That is incredible. Yeah, yeah. And then what did the prisoners experience? You know, like they noticed all these things, but did they have any visions? You know, no, no, they didn't have any visions. They didn't have any of that, but they did notice that that things calmed down. Calmed down. Okay. You know, so So, so it didn't, you didn't focus on the one person, you focus on the environment. Yeah, it's we kind of focused right. on okay. the entire facility. Gotcha. And okay. As a whole. Mm-hmm. And we, you know, we all we were doing was sending healing energy into that facility. Wow. And how and many letting, women did this? How many women? It was like five of us. That's it. That's it. Jeez. So that's the power of our yes. energy. That's the power all of right. our energy. All right. So I need to make a mental note of this because when I do my PhD work. I need to use that in my paper because it's all about how we are a technology and not a technology like you plug in batteries. This is like advanced this, technology. This is the inner technology that we yes. all we all have. Yeah. Well, yes. well, we were having some good results. And I guess the invisible beings, the predatory race had had enough of that. And I was the leader of this group. Okay. So in one session, <laughs> I'll never forget this night, you know, we, we did the whole thing. We did the ambiance inside of our individual dwellings and I was in, in an apartment. And so I lit the candles and I turned the lights off <clears throat> and I had my computer on so that we could continue communicating. Mm-hmm. And, and so we, we started getting into this, the, the Reiki trance, I guess you would call it kind of a trance it's not really a trance but it's a reiki mode and so we were doing this and all of a sudden i felt this huge amount of energy it was negative energy coming toward me and i looked up and there was a cloud of what appeared to be black smoke and it was heading toward me 
and I knew nothing was on fire. I didn't smell any fire. Yes. And I, I kind of knew what it was. And I had gone through all of this, you know, that's a lie program. And, mm-hmm. <laughs> but I was fairly new at it. So here comes this smoke coming at me. And it was kind of, it, it went, it kind of swirled around like a tornado. And then that broke up and got into this big blobby smoky thing. Uh-huh. And then it would go back into a little tornado again, to, I guess, just to scare me as it was coming forward. And I started to get frightened. Yeah. And then as I got frightened, I heard this loud, tele- super loud telepathic voice in my head that says, those prisons are mine. No. So yeah. this, is this the first time you have direct yeah. conversation? I, it, well, in in that sense it yes. was the first, first yeah. visual i'd ever had yeah wow and actually it's the only visual i ever had and so here i was i was sitting on the floor leaning up against the couch mm-hmm. my back up against the couch and my legs underneath the coffee table and i really had no place to go <laughs> yeah you know it's like oh you're like okay, pinned now. you're like pinned in yeah, so I heard this, these prisons are mine. And then I got I got scared and then it mm-hmm. came at me even stronger. And then I remembered, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I know what this is. I'm you know, it took me a second to, yes. to get myself together. Mm-hmm. It took me a second and I said, No, these prisons are not yours. You have no power over these prisons. We do. Wow. And he it I want to say he because the the yeah the, it felt masculine it probably, felt very yeah. masculine mm-hmm. and the voice in that the, the the loud telepathic thought in my head was very masculine and it mm-hmm. was the the emphasis was on mine it was like a it was like a a low roar yeah of the word, of the word it's like mine. that that was his sector yeah. you know that yeah. that he was in charge of in a sense and you know you were sending in special forces yeah to, like yeah, disrupt yeah, and he was exactly. not having it and i so i i went from frightened to wait a minute i know what this is to yeah. getting up my strength to say out loud no these prisons are not yours they're ours and that was probably not the right thing to say because they're not ours but that's yeah. what came out yeah well, we'll we'll let you slide, Sherry, because you were dealing with this yeah. this cloud of hate. Yeah. So <laughs> coming at you. Yeah. So then, he, and then the mental thought came. It was telepathic for sure. It was coming from elsewhere, and it said, "You know, they're laughing at you. They know that this Ray Key crap doesn't work, and so they're just laughing at you." And I don't remember his its exact words, but it was words to that effect. Mm-hmm. And then, and then I remember it saying, who do you think you are? <laughs> and I just, I said, you know what, you're lying to me mm-hmm. and I'm not going for it. And then it faded away. Wow. So I thought, okay, well, that's good. And I went to get in touch with my colleagues who were doing this and uh-huh. my electricity had gone out and my phone had gone out. Yes. Yeah. And I that's- thought, Okay. That's what um, Jenny Randall's report said in time storms. Yep, that happens. Okay, well, yeah. that's good confirmation because I yeah. never heard that before. Yeah, the, so. and, and Paul Eno talks about that in some of his cases where somebody will have a very high electric bill because they'll drain the electricity. Their electric bill will be off the charts wow. and they'll have the electric company come out and make sure it's not a problem. Yeah. And sometimes, it, sometimes it is, you know, but sometimes it's not. And yeah. according to his research and his experience, they do drain, they feed off of electrical panels and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. So I sat back and took a deep breath and I thought, okay, so, so it's not the electricity on, I can't tell my colleagues yeah. what's happening, but they're going, they're continuing on with their Reiki. I know he that. He totally isolated you. Yeah. So you I know? was totally isolated and mm-hmm. I, but I sat back and took a deep breath and closed my eyes and then just kind of let myself relax. Mm-hmm. And as I did that, this big whoosh and here comes this black cloud again this black smoke it came really close to me and what did i say oh it's it started repeating the whole thing over and over again Mm -hmm. and for some reason i had no explanation of this 
it reminded me of an old Monty Python skit that I thought was hilariously funny. Yes. And I burst out laughing and it vanished. It just plain vanished and the lights came back on. Uh, oh. That was the most amazing experience. That, that is I great. I love that. <laughs> you know what? I don't know if you've ever been interviewed by Paul Eno, but you have to be interviewed by them on their show because he teaches people to use humor to get rid of them. You're the perfect example of proof that yeah. works. And yeah, well, you know, having the lights go out because you know they suck all the electricity, yeah. that's probably what was used to manifest that cloud. And oh. for this being to physically come into this reality, he had to get energy from somewhere. You know? Yeah, maybe so. I didn't yeah. think about that. But yeah, yeah, that's probably a possibility. So, so yeah. So then I learned then that laughing was a very, very powerful tool to use. Mm -hmm. And I told Jerry about that. And he said that he had one that used laughter to get rid of his voices. Very good. So, awesome. So, that so was see, there, there's that Jerry. instinctual intuitive badass that you are you were like i'm not having it and then yeah. laughter just bubbled up so i love it <laughs> it just kept repeating and repeating and it just struck my funny bone you know i have a funny sense of humor anyway yeah <laughs> yeah i always liked monty python because they were so outrageously yes. you know showing the world so sarcastic and just they, over the top like yeah over the top mm -hmm. but they were actually sending a really brilliant yeah. message to the world yep and i caught on to that but yeah, so I used to watch their shows all the time. I don't remember the name of the show, but there was several of them that were just so, so funny. Anyway, so that's so good. I'm glad you could tap into that because mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I don't know what anyone listening is probably like, I don't have a clue what I would have done. It would have scared the pants off of anybody. And it scared well, yeah. me too. And yeah. the, the, when I noticed was when I got scared, it came mm -hmm. closer and got stronger. Yes. And I wasn't going to have that. Off of that. Yeah. yeah. Now they're, they, you say that they have a hierarchy and oh, yeah, yeah, they do Sorry. have a hierarchy because this particular entity was, I sensed that he was kind of like a captain, yeah, the rank of captain. Mm -hmm. I don't, he didn't say that, but I, that's what it felt like. Yeah. We can use human words to describe, you know, it's, it's probably the same. The hierarchies that we have here is probably the same with the hierarchies there. And well, that's a perfect lead into the next slide. This is the table of contents of the paper broken down. The introduction, review of literature, discussion, and conclusion, which are the normal things that are in a master's thesis. Mm -hmm. But what I did with the review of literature is I broke it down, part one and part two, and your information, it's in part two. So part one is all about, like we talked about this earlier, the missing 411 cases that David Polites um, curated. And I used his profile points to guide the paper. And then I took Jenny Randall's book, Time Storms, I took her cases and I bumped them up against his cases because the majority of her cases they were living accounts of what happened. The majority of David's cases are deceased or still missing. You yeah. know? So we have no record. We can just, all, all he does is present the facts all Jenny does is present the facts. And it's amazing when you read these books together because her accounts are like the living account of what, what happened with his cases. It's fascinating. Wow. Wow. But anyways, part one is all about the way this hidden predator interacts with humans in a much different way than what is revealed in part two. Because in part one, this predator does not talk. It does not play with his food is what I say. There's no communication. It's they're there one minute, they're gone the next. And usually you are too. And I, I call them an elite special forces unit. They get in, they get out and they do what they have to do. No one ever knows they're there. There's, there's like never even a trace. That is a very different behavior than what we see with you and with Jerry and then with Paul, the three examples that I've used in part two, specifically your information, your and Jerry's information is between pages 54 and 60. And I mm -hmm. think it might go a little bit more for Jerry, um, but your section in particular is pages 54 to 60. And you guys talk about these beings are poking and prodding individuals. They're inserting visions and thoughts and they're interacting with the person. And I think it's in the conclusion, I put that your parasitical predators remind me of the remora, those fish 
that swim underneath sharks and whales, they mm. attach themselves to their bellies and then they just eat whatever crumbs fall from the kill. So that's what these parasites remind me of. They just kind of attach themselves to people and then they just keep poking and feeding and poking and feeding. Yeah, so, and the, the, yeah. the, the difference, well, I don't know if there's a difference or not between us and, and the effect that ha- it, those fish have on the whale, but when the predators are attached to us, they're constantly siphoning energy from us. So we yeah. end up feeling pretty weak. Yeah. You know, physically weak. We have to, you know, we, we don't have our no, enough stamina to do something we would normally do without any problems, or we have to sleep a lot. We just kind of feel a little bit lethargic. Mm-hmm. And so now Jerry has talked about people who couldn't even get out of bed. And I yeah, was like yeah. that a couple of times too. I guess I had been severely attacked during the night without knowing it. And I, I just couldn't get up. I yeah. had to force myself to get up. Like, you know, you have to get up. You have yes. to go to work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know? And you can't be dragging in like you haven't slept all night. I would just put on my, my, I, I, I learned in this whole process to, to change myself like a chameleon changes itself. Mm-hmm. And it was just one of my traits. I was able to pretend that I had all the energy in the world and then I would. And mm-hmm. I would, I, if I was invited to a, a real high class party, mm-hmm. I could dress the role and I could act the role. If I was mm-hmm. invited to a hippie party, I could dress the role and act the role. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it didn't matter if I, yep. you know, if I went to a drag race, I could dress the role and act the role. Yep. It didn't matter what it was. I didn't even know who I was. That's why I could do that. I just yep. learned that was a survival mechanism. Yeah, I was going to say that was that's your superpower that mm-hmm. you had to develop at a young age. And at least now with those examples you were just giving, you were using it in a positive way. I know? was. It was just yeah. to survive. I wasn't yeah. trying to hurt anybody or fool yeah. anybody. You weren't being a psychopath. I, I understand you were definitely adapting to the situation that you found yourself in. Well, one of the things I learned when I, I, w- I had a job with the U.S. Navy in their combat systems division, I got that job when I was 18 years old. Oh, wow. And and then, yeah, they they thought I was pretty smart. So uh, I didn't ever think I was very smart for a long time. <laughs> so, well, because you you had these voices telling you that, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I yeah. would do things that would show that I was pretty smart. And then, then they I would probably be like, no, you're stupid. They don't know no, what they're talking really about. No, you're really stupid. Yeah. They don't know. Yeah, they don't yeah. know what they're talking about. They're just trying to make you feel good, you know, so don't pay any attention to them. But the, wow. the Navy thought I was pretty smart. And so I got put into the combat systems division and specifically into their sonar group. And I remember one of the things that the boss that I had at the time, he was a retired uh, captain, I think. Anyway, he was a retired officer. And so he went into civilian life and then he ended up running this whole department. And so I remember him telling me one time, the best thing in the world that anyone can ever do in this life is adapt. You have to learn how to adapt. Yes. And I said, yeah, I know how to adapt. Yeah, you're like, to... tell me something I don't already know. Yeah, I know. I know. I'm real good at adapting. Yeah. <laughs> See, and to me, that's a synchronicity. When somebody says something that, you know, I don't think he probably would never even realize how deep that went for you. Oh, you know, probably to say not. something like just, that. Yeah, he it, was just... it, only a synchronicity would do something like that. And that usually comes from people that we don't even know. So I love that yeah. you told that story. Yeah. So here, here I am 18 years old. I'm in the combat systems division. Mm-hmm. I'm specifically working for the sonar group. And so I'm learning how to read the equipment and how to do all that stuff. And we were, at the time, the shipyard was converting one of the big aircraft carriers and let me think if I, it was the Midway, the USS Midway, I think. Okay. And, and so it came time for inspection before a sea trial. Okay. Well, I had done an awful lot of work on that and women have never done an inspection on it for a sea, ever, oh, wow. ever. Very and good. so I said, uh, well, you know, am I going to go on the inspection? And my boss said, well, no. I said, why? He said, because you're a girl. I said, what are you talking about? <laughs> I know people I, nowadays are probably like, what? But this I mean, was way before yeah. women's lib. Way yeah. the heck so everybody calm down. Yeah, yeah. This, this was, well, it was right. back then. <laughs> this was this was back in the 60s. Yes. 
And mm-hmm. so I said, what are you talking about? I never heard that before. Mm-hmm. You know, you're just a girl. And so, so anyway, the guys who were running the computers and they had computers back in those days, they were mm-hmm. brilliant uh, computer programmers. The computers were the size of a whole room, but mm-hmm. You know, and the teletype machine made an awful lot of noise, and it was it had a delayed, clicky noise. When you go to type on it, you didn't hear it until afterwards, and it was it was difficult to run. Yeah, that would be. <laughs> yeah, and so and I had my clearance, so the programmers came and said, "Well, can we make an exception?" And so I don't know what he did if he went and talked to his boss, who talked to his boss, who talked to his boss, or whatever. The next thing I knew. He came back and he said, well, you have to have some coveralls because you're going on this ship full of young men who have been out to sea and they're just going to go crazy seeing a a girl out there. So they had to camouflage me. They had to camouflage me with these. One of the one of the technicians brought his coveralls in and he was six foot one. I was going to say, you probably look like a little kid. Yeah, 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 I did. And, (laughs) and, you know, I I had a pretty baby face, too, when I was young. And well, geez, you are a kid. You're like, what, 19? I was was 18 and a half, 19. You're still a kid. Yeah. And (laughs) so they had they had me and they had this lady librarian and she was in her in her mid 60s. And we were the only two women in the whole department. Wow. So That's awesome. So the guys brought the guy brought his coveralls and the librarian took me into the restroom and we got me dressed and she rolled up my pant legs. Yes. You know, yes. <laughs> pretty I just, thickly I rolled up. It. You can yep. just imagine, right? <laughs> and uh, yeah. so I put my hunting boots on because I did like to go hunting and fishing at the time. Mm-hmm. And uh, then they put a hard hat on me and you know gave me a notebook. And at the time I used to take shorthand. Okay. And uh, so I, I was all excited. And so mm-hmm. the day came and, and we went on the, on the ship uh, and started the inspection. And I was taking notes profusely mm-hmm. and uh, of everything I saw, because I saw new stuff that I hadn't seen in the office and in the practice and stuff like that. And then they'd find something wrong and I'd write it down and write down the remedy. And just, mm-hmm. I was taking notes. I was yeah. being like a secretary, right? Uh-huh. I was taking notes. So I was all thrilled and the inspection was over and we came back and I came back to the office and my boss said, well, how was it? And I said, this is, this was wonderful. Look at all the notes I took and his, his mouth dropped to the floor. He said, you're not supposed to take notes off of the ship. You can get fired for that and throw oh in jail. My God. And I said, oh, <laughs> you're like, here, take it. <laughs> so, so I tried to give it to him and he said, no. So we yeah. called the librarian oh in and God. she said, he said, Mary, take these and shred them right now. Don't even read them. And he didn't want to read them. He didn't want to look at them. He just took them. Oh, I didn't even God. get to review them. So that was the end of that story. But that yeah. is too funny. I love it. I could just picture you all excited with like you did such a good job and then it's like shred them <laughs> well I thought I was going to type them up and hand them out yes you know? <laughs> yep yeah I would have totally been the same way I'm going to put them in a powerpoint I'm going to you know in the yeah. next meeting I'm going to present them I'm going to be so you know I'm going to be like like yeah. the star <laughs> yeah right <laughs> and then right. they shredded them <laughs> yeah they shredded them that was oh, hilarious that is yeah. awesome you've had an amazing amazing background I'm so glad that I found your work and I put it in the paper and we had time to talk. Why don't we take a short break and we'll go through the list of the things that these parasites say, not only to you, but some of the people that you've worked with. And I think that would be really helpful if we approach the the next 20, 30 minutes that we talk after the break on the Mm self-defense aspect of this. Okay. We are back and this is Metaphysical Mining and I am interviewing Sherry Sweeney. We're going to switch gears and I'm going to read a quote from the book that Sherry co-authored with Jerry Marzinski. This is the book right here and there'll be a link in the show descriptions. I am on page 86 and Sherry, this is actually one of your quotes. It was a common occurrence for a bygone memory to suddenly pop into my mind. It didn't matter if my actual behavior had been good or bad. The voices presented the memory as shameful. Sometimes memories were of something scandalous I was supposed to have done. Even if I knew I had not done these things, I was left with an unsettled feeling that maybe I had. 
Now, I highlighted that in the book because that happens to me. And I know that a lot of what you, you post, you and Jerry both have posted on your websites is you have a list of the things that these parasites say, mm -hmm. but for some of us, we actually get these movies that play. And what happens with me that I started noticing after I really did an in-depth analysis of your work and your blog, I started saying, okay, well, let's see if this happens with me. And so how they will try and attack me is I will just be minding my own business, doing whatever I'm doing in a day. And all of a sudden this memory will, it's almost as if the parasite goes through the Rolodex of your memories mm -hmm. and it's, Boop, we're going to send this one because we know that it can elicit this response that maybe we'll feed off of. And a lot of the times it's from when I was a child. And mm -hmm. it might be an embarrassing thing that either happened to me or that I caused. And it, even though I'm 46 years old, this memory that comes in that's maybe from five or six, it still has that imprint of that emotion. So yeah. when they bring this up from your cells, it's like, whoa, I totally forgot about that. You get that feeling of, yeah. yeah, you get that rush. And then you're like, wait a minute, that's ridiculous. That I was a kid. I'm, get out of here. That's stupid. Well, then it hit me. After I noticed that happening, I'm like, whoa, that's what Sherry's talking about. Except it's not voices. It's actually these movies that they're playing, my memories. Mm -hmm. And it finally clicked and I flipped the switch on it and I started using your method. And I said out loud, you have never been human. You've never been human before. You totally played your cards with me because you are throwing this in my face. But if you were human and you had actually lived through the development of being a child, a teenager, a young adult, a grown adult, and hit your mid forties, you would have realized that that is a perfectly acceptable thing that a five or six year old does. And that it, I understand that I had to actually go through that in order to learn from that situation. And I haven't done that since that age. So nice try, have a good day. Because okay. you're dealing with a grown adult. <laughs> you can't throw stuff like that in my face because it doesn't stick. And as soon as that happened, the memory was gone. And I, to this day, don't even remember what the memory was. It vanished from my Rolodex. So it was like, that doesn't work for her. Throw it out. Yeah. Now they'll, they'll try other things. Yes, they have. Yeah. Yep. And, and maybe they'll show me something from when I was in the corporate environment. I'm like, you know what? It's not going to work. Because stuff like that happens all the time with people. That's what being human is all about. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you obviously were never human. You have no idea what you're talking about. I'm not going to let that affect me because I was 26 years old and I was stupid <laughs> and I don't do that anymore. I keep saying things like that over and over again. And then those memories just fade. Now, that was thing. just my example of how I used your program in a way? Well, so. you did use the program. And when I say that's a lie program, that was for the moment that I was in the process of everything I had been taught was a lie. Yes. And so I had to call it a lie. But in fact, what it is for people who uh, don't want to use it, that's a lie. Because, you know, the whole, the whole idea is not to give any, any negative energy out. Yeah. That's the whole idea because that's what they want. They want the negative energy so they can feel. Yeah, they want you to feel embarrassed. They want you to feel shame. They want, they want you, want you to, to relive feel, it. Yeah. yeah. And it's like, yeah, that's what happened back then. But I don't need to feel that now because a lot of the things that, that, that I notice they throw in my face, it's petty stuff. That still happens to me from time to time. I, I like to go out on my porch and have a cup of coffee in the morning and watch the sun come up. I'll be sitting there not thinking of anything other than I'm looking at it and, and awing at the sun coming up because it's so beautiful uh, mm -hmm. if it's not a foggy uh, or a snowy day. <laughs> yeah. And and so I'll be there very, very peaceful and very quiet. And all of a sudden, some old uh, memory will pop up and I'm and I'm like, oh, come on. That was then. This is now. Get, yeah. get on with it. I don't give them any negative energy. I don't have to say that's a lie because it wasn't a lie. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a memory of something that that did happen, yeah. but that was over and done with long ago. Yeah. I dealt with it. I, you know, got rid of my emotions with it. I made amends with it or whatever it was I did yes. with it. Yep. Yeah. And the thing is, is that they don't know that. So that that's where I got empowered because I was like, 
you don't have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> they yeah. don't. And they, they, they actually have no power of their own whatsoever. Yeah. And people give them power and that's their mistake. That's yep. the big mistake that humans make is they listen and they, and then they relive the, the moment yeah. over and over and over again. They can't get it out. It's like a song running through your head. Yeah. You can't get rid but of it. But it's like, until you realize that this is not you throwing this back in your own face, like you dumbass, why did you do that? Yeah. Or maybe you did something when you were younger and then you did it again when you were older. And then you were like, oh shit, I can't believe I did that. And then they throw that in your face until you read your material and you really, really read it. You let it marinate. <laughs> you think yeah. about it and then you start practicing it. Then it's almost like your frequency shifts. It it's does. insane because that, that's literally how I felt. As soon as it clicked, it was that fast. As soon as it clicked and I said, you've never been human. That was it. It was game over. You're done because you can't do anything to me now. Because even if you throw something that was terrible, maybe I knew better. Maybe you're a teenager. By, you know, by the time you're a teenager, you should know better with certain things. But we're stupid teenagers. We do stupid things. Maybe you hurt your mom's feelings or you got into an argument and you told her you hated her. Whatever. Stupid teenagers do stuff like that. But you look back on it now and you're like, geez, it's true. My mom, I hated her. You know, that's a terrible thing. I knew better. I knew, I knew how hurtful that was. And then they throw that in your face. And it's like, no, I, I'm not even going to let that slide. That's not going to affect me anymore because I know teenagers say that. And my mom knows that I love her and she knows that I wasn't being a jerk. So that's just an example. Yeah, I, here's, so. yeah well, here's <laughs> another example. People will do that to other people. And those people that do it to other people are being influenced by that dark yes. side. Oh my God, I'm so glad you brought up. That, yeah. that is one of the open-ended questions that I started off in the introduction. And I did answer a lot of the questions, but I left some sitting out there so that we could discuss them through this mm -hmm. channel. I even mentioned the channel in the paper. And one of the questions was, are we dealing with a self-serving predatory race using an advanced form of psychological warfare? Mm -hmm. They terraform our reality through us, through our human mind. That's what you're talking about is they will influence somebody to say something to somebody else because they yeah. literally yeah. can't come here. You saw how much energy it needed to physically come into your living room. It had to suck everything around it because it couldn't suck your energy that day. You know, no. you were connected to those other women energetically. You had this strong bond and energetic protective circle and it couldn't take from that. It had to take from its surroundings. And the and best so, it could do was create itself as some kind of a, a figure yeah. that, that appeared like smoke. That's the yes. very best that it could do. Yeah. It's like a plasma. Yeah. I call them plasma entities. So that's mm -hmm. kind of like what Jenny Randall's describes in time storms. Yeah, no, she doesn't say well, it's an entity. She says it's an earth phenomenon. So, mm -hmm. but well, I it, mean, doesn't, it doesn't matter what you interpret it as. Yeah, the fact exactly. is going on and it's affecting exactly. people's psyche and it is affecting us. It, it, it's affecting the whole, the whole humanity on this planet Yeah, where, okay, you have, let's take a family feud, for example, mm -hmm. that's going to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth yeah. ad nauseum and it can do it for generations. Until, until that is broken and mm -hmm. somebody has to break that chain. And once the chain is broken, then, then things will begin to change and it won't change overnight. It'll change slowly because these are individuals in this chain and mm -hmm. each one has their own set of memories of perceptions and how they perceive this feud for yeah. the example that we're using a family feud mm -hmm. or a neighborhood feud or whatever like that. They even did TV programs about this to show how ridiculous they were. Mm -hmm. And we have history of famous family feuds. And now I can't yes. remember the names of yeah. them, but the Sackfields and McCoys. I remember yeah, there, those. There yeah. you go. And we've got yeah. one in Kentucky where I live <laughs> and I don't remember the name of it, but it's a real famous family feud. Yeah. I think finally all of the descendants are gone or there's one left or something like that. And so the feud is over. They don't have anyone to argue with anymore. So it's done no, with them. No. You know, it died with them. No, but, but the, the catalyst is these beings that are, yeah. you know, pumping them up. Okay. So let's stay on point with what we were talking about. Because I was talking about how they don't tell me things, but they'll show me things. And mm -hmm. then, but then what you and Jerry have listed 
is examples of what you yourself have heard and then what the patients have heard. I'm going to go through, you have seven things listed on the website that you personally, these are messages from the voices. And I'm just going to pick a few of them, but one of them is no one will ever love you because you are a piece of garbage, a waste of flesh. Another one is you have no talent. You would, you would never hire you for a job. You're a failure. You are worthless. You'll never succeed at anything. So give up trying. You are the worst thing you've ever done. And there's no way to forgive yourself. Those are the things you've personally heard from these yeah. voices. Yeah. I've wow. also heard, why don't you uh, do everybody a favor and kill yourself? Wow. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And that's sad because that could be an explanation for a lot of suicides. Yeah. You know? Especially today. Yeah. With the, the whole debacle going on, you know, with people being isolated, especially the yes. young, the younger folks, uh, yeah. they, I can imagine what the voices are telling them. Yeah, exactly. You know? And I'm glad you brought up the isolation point because Susan B. Martinez, I used her book in the paper as well. It's called The Field Guide to the Spirit World. It's an amazing book. I'm excited to interview her one of these days too, but she talks about this predator from the criminal aspect. She has a lot of data about serial killers mm -hmm. and how they heard these voices and how from a young age, they were isolated. I mean, she goes on and on about how these evil spirits, she calls them, we can call them the hidden predator. It's, it's all the same thing. They isolate people. That's big with them. They want you isolated and then they start bombarding you. It's crazy to see. She has these charts and it's like your list, but it is horrific. And these serial killers will actually commit murders because of what these voices are saying. Yeah. Now there's, there's a different, there's a slight difference between those serial killers and myself Yes. in that I had the fortitude or the strength or the pre-knowledge or whatever it was that got me through this because I was isolated. Mm -hmm. And, yep. and then I got bombarded to the point where, you know, I just, I just wanted to go away. I just wanted to disappear because mm -hmm. it was too painful. Yeah. And, but I never, ever wanted to hurt anybody. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I had the idea that these were not coming from me and maybe these serial killers don't know that, or if they do, they're so afraid that they think that these, these entities have power over them and they don't. Yeah. You know, I think maybe that's the difference because had I not had this, this ability, mm -hmm. I could have turned out to be a Jeffrey Dahmer mm -hmm. just as easily. Because yeah, I, got you, I would definitely recommend her book just because of your background and what you went through. Because I, I mean, I'm not saying that your voices and what you went through was similar to their experience, but you can see the pattern. You can yeah. see it in what she, the way she does a very good job of going through this horrific material mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. she does a real good job of setting everything up and and the charts man just the charts that you could just see on a couple pages this person was this serial killer they said this it resulted in this it, mm -hmm. it's amazing there is this spectrum of the way in which the human condition will manifest this type of, you know, engagement with the predator <laughs> into this reality. There's like the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to how a human will respond to this type of poking and prodding. And it has to do a lot with the way this predator manipulates our epigenetics, our environment, and how that feeds into our DNA and how it shapes us. And they have this foreknowledge of biology and chemistry and electromagnetics. They have this understanding of the human body that I don't even think we're at a level of even knowing ourselves. I agree and with you there. <laughs> and they, that what brings to mind here is all of the, not counting the poisons in, in the atmosphere and in our environment that cause us to be sick, mm -hmm. but the epigenetics of being sick is important because, you know, really we can be surrounded by all of these chemicals and everything and if we if we don't take them in in our psyche they won't affect us as badly 
-hmm. They won't kill us unless we drink them directly. But, you know, I mean, within reason, you mm -hmm. know what I'm getting at? Yes. So the mm -hmm. strength of our epigenetics, which is definitely tied into our minds and our thoughts and our feelings. I had a, I have a sister who passed away and she, she passed away from cancer. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. And yeah, it was, it was several years ago now. And, mm -hmm. and then my son, my eldest son passed away from cancer. Mm -hmm. So that happened in just within a couple of years of each other. And wow. I kept trying to tell each of them mm -hmm. that they should not go through chemotherapy because that would poison them and likely kill them. And then their side of the family was saying, no, no, no. Yeah. You have to go through it because that's how people survive and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. So the battle was on and then it was up to the individual that my sister and, and my son, I gave them all the information. Yeah. They looked, they looked at it. They confirmed that they looked at it mm -hmm. and then they got talked into yeah. going through the chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. They were both starting to, to head on the right path. And then they ended up going on the other path because they were influenced by the people around them. Now, the people yeah. around them didn't hate them, you know. Yeah, they, they just, they, they don't they know just, any they, better. They were yeah. ignorant. They were yeah. ignorant. Mm -hmm. And, and of course, one of them was a, a doctor. Yes. <laughs> a conventional doctor. Yep. And that's all he knew. Yes, unfortunately. So unfortunately, you know, they, they both got talked into doing that. And of course, they both passed away. So I blame mm -hmm. the chemotherapy and killing them. Yep. But I also have to consider that it was the dark side that helped push them into it, helped them weaken their, their fortitude mm -hmm. because they kept dwelling on their illness. You yes. know, you can't keep dwelling on my illness is so bad, it's going to kill me. Mm -hmm. Because if you do that, now that when the doctor says you only have three months to live, guess what? You yeah. only have three months to live. Yeah, yeah. I that makes me mad because it's almost like they wrote a prescription for this individual and said, here you go. Well, and, well there are definitely cures yeah. for cancer <laughs> exactly. and every kind, but I know that there are cures for cancer and they are not the conventional way. Yes. But then if you don't go the conventional way, have a hard time because, you know, the conventional minded people who have been brainwashed through their lifetime, mm -hmm. their perception is off. Their perception mm -hmm. is skewed to believe that the people in the white coats know what they're talking about and they don't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a it's a catch 22 and mm -hmm. the, the dark side is behind it all. Yeah. And that's why I, I, I used that language of, are they terraforming our reality? Because they have to use us to create an environment mm -hmm. that is specific to them. So they yeah. can't come here and do this themselves. We have to be their avatars. And so that's a perfect example. And um, uh, Pierre Sabak, I don't know if you remember his information, he talks about all these structures, education, religion, medicine, legal, all these things were set up by this predatory race, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. And it's just been playing over and over and over again. And it's a form of terraforming. It's like, let's make them think that they're brilliant doctors and let's steer them down this path. You guys do a great job of going through the history of yeah. medicine and how it was influenced and people we're definitely influenced by something other than human because the path they took us down does not benefit us. Absolutely. Nothing seems to be benefiting us. <laughs> and it, everything's a lie. Someone is terraforming this environment and it's not for our benefit. No, it it's, isn't. It's that simple. <laughs> the, the sooner humans begin to realize that they're being influenced by an outside force that they can't see, Mm -hmm. that they can definitely think about. They can have the thoughts in their minds or they can have the, the movie running through their, their memories or whatever the case may be. It's there. It's real. It doesn't come from them. People need to learn who they are. I mean, who the heck are we, right? Yeah. Who's ever had a thought of their own? Mm -hmm. I read a lot when I first started down this path. I mean, I have a corporate background, so I had to learn a lot. I didn't have any family lineage in this metaphysical stuff. I had to learn it all from scratch. A lot of the stuff that I read, you couldn't apply it 
And that's what I like with you and Jerry. You can actually apply something. I'll talk with Jerry about this, but taking the you know rubber band and snapping your hand, like you're, you can literally apply this if it's that bad. And then with yours, you can start training yourself. It's like, oh, there's that thought again. Oh, this is what I do. And then you can start training yourself. When I read that passage from your blog, you had to deprogram. You had to keep going and going. It's just like when you play sports. Some of us were naturally gifted at certain sports, but you still have to practice. You Absolutely. still have to learn plays. You still have to develop your skills <laughs> to a different level. That's what you're doing with this type of mental exercise is you're doing it over and over and again. As soon as you see it, you have to respond. And then yeah, you once you do that, even... it's like memory. It's like when you're weight training, muscle has memory. You take some time off, you get back in the gym. Next thing you know, boom, your muscle's back. Yeah, so in... you, you can be saying something like you can be saying a phrase that you've always said, this makes me sick. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't really make you sick, but if you say it often enough, you will yeah. get sick. Yeah, you definitely. have to retrain your verbiage of, yeah. oh, I don't like that rather than this mm -hmm. makes me sick. Yeah. Or I need to think about this a little bit differently than I have before, mm -hmm. rather than this makes me sick or you're killing me, you know, yep. that, that kind of thing. People just do this without thinking about it. Yeah, because and the subconscious doesn't know any different. It doesn't mm -hmm. know you're being sarcastic. <laughs> it doesn't know sarcasm. It yeah, just takes yeah. everything literally. So and, and, yeah, that's yeah, one thing I, I, I think, had to learn. Yeah. I think people might benefit from reading the, the second part of the That's a Lie program on my okay. blog. I'll put that in the show description. Yeah, there's okay. a link at the bottom of the That's a Lie uh, blog that goes to that one. Okay. So all they have to do is click on that and read that. It's not a long read. It's five or six pages maybe, but there's lots okay. of pictures and il uh, uh, illustrations in there. Okay. I like to write with illustrations as much as possible because it helps people visualize. Yeah, it helps me because I'm a very visual person. Yeah. I really like the illustrations on your website. Let's see. A lot of this we already answered. Now, I do want your opinion. This question here, is the predatory intelligence an aspect of some elaborate alchemical process, which on a macro scale maintains our reality's harmonious balance and which... It acts as an initiation program. It's like an initiation program built into the Earth's environment where the detection of the predator triggers a shamanic gene in someone, regardless if they have the support structure to nurture the gifts. Do you feel, looking back, that you somehow went through an initiation with some of the negative things that happened? Well, these were horrific things. I'm not trying to make light of that. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying, looking back, can you see at all any type of initiation that was triggered alchemically, you know, transformed you? Yeah, I do within myself. And then I recognized it in other people too. Okay, the, the, the initiation <laughs> is what happens when you get attacked and then you, it, it, the attack will sometimes bring out some of your unconscious problems the problems that we have throughout our lives. It brings up the, the ugly past and it brings up the things that you're still hanging on to and you have, it's bringing up old garbage and old baggage and stuff you haven't quite gotten rid of. And when you, when it continues to be brought up and then you stop and realize, okay, this isn't coming from me. This old memory is being injected into my current day mm -hmm. to make me give off negative energy for food for these entities. When you realize that, then what you're doing is you're dealing with the old subconscious programming, conditioning that you've been struggling with without knowing it. Mm -hmm. You're shedding those triggers. You're getting rid of them. You're growing in the meantime. So I think that's an alchemical change. Yes. Yeah, it definitely is. And I'm glad you put it in the way that you just put it, because it's almost like this predatory archetype is forcing you to do the shadow work that Carl Jung talks about. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I tried to end the paper with some hope that even though this predatory species, this archetype, however you want to call it, yes, there is deadly and dangerous consequences, but mm -hmm. not everybody experiences that negative side of it. 
sometimes they do go through this alchemical process and it is a catalyst for it. And that is kind of the light at the end of the tunnel. It's not the train coming at you. It's the light that you can guide yourself towards that people like you, people like Jerry, people like Paul are the examples that I show of you can wrestle with this and you can come out on top and then look at all the people that you guys are helping because of this. It doesn't just stop with you. You keep going. You try and stop the perpetuation of it. And when I'm talking about the shamanic gene, that's what I'm talking about Mm -hmm. is that once you start going out into the community and teaching others, that's a modern version of shamanism. Because, you know, when we think of shamanism, we think of somebody that lives off in the woods, away from the village. They've been appointed, usually from birth, they're appointed. They have these gifts, they nurture them, they develop them. These are the people that protected the tribes. They did the medicine. They handled everything. They handled the warring with the other tribes, the other villages. They had to protect everything. Not only did they do the medicine, but they were protectors as well. Sometimes they found the food, but we live in these modern conditions. Does that mean that that this aspect of humanity is lost? No, it's not. It just has to come through us in a different way. I look at somebody like you and somebody like Jerry and Paulino, those three examples of this is the way that shamanic gene manifests in this type of environment, this digital age. It's the way in which it functions in this time period. I don't think that that way of living is lost. I think it's just evolved and adapted. And you are an example of that. Do you agree or is that pretty much out there? No, it's it's not too far out there. <clears throat> the, the, the shaman because I've, I've, I've worked with a shaman before I did, I did, what do you call it? Soul retrieval. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really interesting and very beneficial. But what I noticed about this shaman is that it was a female and she actually traveled with me Mm -hmm. on my, on my, my spiritual journey, my, you know, searching for the the different aspects of soul that had left because Uh When you become, when you're traumatized, they say, you split. when you're traumatized, your soul, your soul's like, I, I've had enough of this. I'm gone. I'm, I'm out of here, you know, yeah. <laughs> and then they leave. And then I was studying up on this. And then I noticed in myself that, you know, I've kind of felt, even though I'd been through all this and I'd conquered all this, I still kind of felt a little empty. Mm-hmm. And so I thought, well, let me just give this soul retrieval thing a try. And because I'm scientifically minded, right? Yeah. I like to try things to see if they're valid. I've spent six uh, days and, and nights at the Monroe Institute to see if out-of-body travel was actually real. Mm-hmm. And, and of course, I found out that it is. So with the shaman, as I understand it, they will travel with you on your journey to make sure mm-hmm. that you don't end up in any danger. Yes. Because they'll help you if you, they leave you alone until you end up in some kind of dangerous situation. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. what she explained to me. So I could kind of feel her presence, but it wasn't obnoxious. It wasn't in mm-hmm. the way. And and so I think that's the difference between what Jerry and, and Paul and I are, and other people are doing. My greatest joy is to help other people see that they're not living on this planet alone, mm-hmm. that the feelings that they're getting are not necessarily coming from them. And most of the time, they're not. If people know that and realize that, they will actually take this this spiritual leap into more awareness, expanded awareness of who Mm -hmm. they are. And they will realize that they are the ones that have the power. And it's an it's the Essenes called it inner technology. And it's the inner technology that create and and there's a language that is with the universe that uh, is our emotions it's an emotion combination of the thought and emotions together Mm -hmm. the heart math institute has been studying on this for many years and when you have that connection and you realize that that's the, the language with the universe is not in words it's in emotions 
-hmm. when you have a when you have a desire and you put some emotion into it then you can create that gives it the fuel that That gives it the fuel yeah yeah, Mm -hmm. that's the language that connects with universe because universe is all energy Mm -hmm. and in all kinds of forms whether it's plasma form or electromagnetic form or whatever form it is it's energy that yeah that hasn't become manifest into something solid yet it's a potential they call it a potential yep <clears throat> i'm glad you brought up the spectrum because i do remember i put that in my paper i took that from your book it was on page 133 and you show the light spectrum and it shows yeah. the little teeny tiny bit that we see yeah and then yeah. that vast majority of what we don't see and that's where these time storms and this hidden predator operate from yeah now i read a yeah. book from it it was uh, written by a physicist and I don't remember which one now (laughs) because I read several physics books Mm -hmm. anyway he was giving a comparison of how much our eyes see compared to the whole visual the whole light spectrum and he took the example of the Empire State Building that's the whole light spectrum and how much of that do we see Mm -hmm. well in comparison we see the the amount that a flea would cover on a windowsill wow that's yeah. the uh, that's how much visual spectrum we actually have with our eyes. We have other senses besides our eyes. We have feeling, we have intuition, we have all yep. those things and they are very real. Do you want me to go through the messages that you guys recorded that were said to your patients? That's the list I have here because we went oh, sure. through the stuff that was said to you, but I'll read through a few of them. Like I said, there's there's a hundred and five. Okay. That's a lot. Folks. These are from Jerry's patients. Yeah. It says messages reported by patients. I took this directly from the website. Just listen to some of these. If they sound familiar, go on to their websites. I'll put all the links in the description and then you just read all read through them. Like I said, there's over a hundred of them. Plus yours on top of that, it's over a hundred. And I remember Jerry saying, it's like a playbook. So Mm -hmm. once you read these and you're aware of it, and you're aware of everything we've talked about, how to respond to it, you read those two blog posts by Sherry, the That's a Lie, part one and two, then you have some tools. You can start testing this. So here's a couple of the things. Before you start, I'd like Uh to say, here's one way that, that people can test this. Okay. They can watch the news, the conventional news. Oh, okay. And see how the news is telling them to be afraid and to mm-hmm. be scared and to be blah, 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 blah. You know, we're yes. going to this war. Mm-hmm. This one's doing that. This one's doing that. And you need to be afraid. Yes. You, you've got a food shortage. You need to be afraid. Everything is you need to be afraid. Mm-hmm. They may not say those words, but that's what they're yeah. projecting is you need to have fear inside of you. And that way you'll follow our instructions and that mm-hmm. is those entities feeding you through them yeah they don't even know it yeah that's the terraforming that i was that's, talking about yeah. so if, um, when you read these things and the people go and read the rest of it if they want to they can use that as the playbook and yep. then compare that to what they're hearing on the conventional news once you train yourself to see this you can't unsee it yeah. and that's what i wanted to show people in my paper is that once once you read this paper and they read your material, if they if they read all the books that I read, you can't not see it. You just can't. It's it's everywhere. You see it in the news. You will start seeing it everywhere. Yeah, you'll see it <laughs> and, in the doctor's office. You'll yeah. see it. Yeah, you'll see it everywhere. Absolutely. And things people say. Somebody will be provoked to say something to you. I've noticed with certain family members that come to visit, because now I'm paying attention mm-hmm. that no fault of their own, they'll say certain things, almost say the exact same thing every time they come to visit. It used to start an argument between myself and my husband. Mm -hmm. It doesn't anymore. Because the last time it was brought up, I changed the topic immediately. And there was another time I just completely ignored what they said. And and it literally (laughs) got it down. You can watch somebody malfunction because you just messed up the program. People can try that with friends and family. It's a pattern of saying something at certain times. It might be certain times a year. It may be around the holidays. Start Mm -hmm. paying attention to that stuff. And when it happens, stop it immediately. 
take the upper hand. Here's some things that could come into your head or be said to you by somebody else. And these are the uh, messages reported by patients. You have no reason to feel good. Don't trust your intuition. Don't treat yourself with respect. People don't care about you. So why should you be kind to them? That is a big one. You'll never have enough to survive. We were just talking about that. You have many painful decisions to face. Okay, who doesn't? <laughs> I mean, come on. That, tell us something we don't know. Life is suffering. That's one of the, the four noble truths of the foundation of Buddhism. I have that on my wall. Life is suffering. We already know that. You're going to get sick if you blah, blah, blah. Look at all the ugliness around you. You're going to fail. I'm sure we've all heard that one. Your life is a mess. I mean, we've all heard that from our parents yeah. sometimes. <laughs> and sometimes it's- You'll you know, never get anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes they're like, what are you doing? I can't watch this train wreck. You can laugh at that stuff, but- Life is a crock of crap. <laughs> That's funny. Your future is grim. You have nothing to look forward to. This is stuff that plays in these mm -hmm. patients' minds over and over again, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. Let's see. Yeah. You're wasting your time. You don't have enough for yourself to be giving anything away. You're not worthy of anything better. That's just a few of the things that Jerry has reported from his patients where it, it runs like a loop. And yeah, it, and they can't get rid of it until yeah. they know that those thoughts are not their own. All right. I think we've done a lot. Yeah, we have. And we've we only touched done. the surface. <laughs> I know. I know. What I'll do is I'll see what kind of feedback we get from this. Maybe we didn't touch upon something or I'll go through these questions again. And if you can think of something that we could have another conversation about maybe go deeper into certain areas. Maybe you want me to read something else from your blog that we could do another show on that's helpful, that helps empower people. I think when you're aware of these things, they're less scary. We could probably safely say something like that. When you're aware of it, it's less scary and you're more willing to do something about it when it does come up. Is that pretty accurate, you think? Yeah, it is. And the thing is that uh, people need to remember that they are the ones with the power, not the yes. bad guys. Yes. And, and I'm calling them bad guys on purpose because none of those entities are good guys. Yeah. Now, there are, I'm told that there are some good entities out there, and but they're not of this clan. And if they are, that's great. And I welcome them. But, you know, I'd be very specific because of what I went through. And yes. I know, I know yes. how easy it is to invite them in. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, because even after going through everything that I went through, I could invite them in easily and destroy my life. Why would I do that? Yeah. And yeah. we're just, just so everyone knows, we're being very specific here. We're talking about this type of phenomenon that I wrote about in the paper that, you know, I took all these different examples from different disciplines and smushed them all together and said, this is the pattern. This isn't all entities. This isn't yeah. all entities. Yeah, this, this is a very This particular clan of entities, I call them a clan. I don't want to call them a tribe because that's kind of an insult to the tribes on earth. But, you know, so, or group, you know, so I don't join any groups. Mm -hmm. I won't join any groups because I know how groups work. They start out with a good intention and then they get infiltrated. They get corrupted, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and they get corrupted. Yeah. And, and the people don't notice that that's going on mm -hmm. because... Like these entities do, sometimes they will start with things that will make you trust them. Jerry had a patient that he had a, a heck of a time getting rid of his voices because his voices would really do some evil stuff. And then they'd turn around and do some nice stuff yeah. to help him out. And then he's like, yeah, I think I got a handle on him now. Well, that's mm -hmm. a lie. Yeah. So, so yeah. And then after, they turn around and do something bad. And then now yeah. this is no longer positive and they keep stringing Sure, right, that person right. along. That, yeah, and that's yeah. someone who was diagnosed with schizophrenia. So mm -hmm. schizophrenia is the top end of the line mm -hmm. of being affected by these things, but everybody on the planet is being affected by them. Yeah. In some yeah, way or that's another. That's that spectrum that I was talking about. Yeah. There's a spectrum and then there's the hierarchy. And it all funnels down and smooths out. It's kind of like that bell curve. There's the hierarchy, bad guys, the schizophrenia, and then it all comes down from there. Mm -hmm. And like I said in the paper, most people probably go their whole lives and not get the worst of it. They'll get the things like I do, where every once in a while you get a thought, you get a memory, and you're like, ah, that sucked. Most people, that's how they'll be affected. But we really do need to be aware of even those little things because a certain memory can set somebody off. It doesn't matter how healthy you are. 
mentally or, you know, metaphysically, we just need to be aware that there is this hierarchy. There is this spectrum. This is real. You're not crazy. Even things like being jealous of not necessarily a partner, but being jealous that somebody has something that you don't have and you wish mm -hmm. you did. Yeah. Being uh, resentful. Being, being re you know, yeah, like yeah. Yeah. Somebody says something and, or even you read an, an article on the news and you're like, oh God, they're just so stupid. Well, maybe they are and maybe they aren't. Maybe yeah. they're being influenced by these, these demons and mm -hmm. You know, like you can call them any name you like. Uh, yeah. The Christ Christians would probably call them demons, which they're pretty close mm -hmm. to demons, as far as I'm concerned. The 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 Gnostics call them archons, and so yeah. I'm I can call them archons. They're they're yeah. all the same. They're all the same. Yeah, all yeah. Same I, list, I think I have like two paragraphs of just the different names of what they're called all across the globe. The globe, it's, yeah. Yeah. There's a name in every every walk of life has mm -hmm. a name for this. All of our That's ancestors nice. knew about this. This is nothing new, people. <laughs> it's no, just this that, goes back. This goes yeah. back thousands of years old, and yes. I don't know if they originated on Earth for the for the benefit of us growing mm -hmm. and uh, growing spiritually, or if they came to Earth from another place. I don't know that answer. Yeah, I don't think. And honestly, those kinds of questions. I don't think we're ever going to get an answer to. I don't really and think they're important yeah, actually. Yeah, they're, yeah. They're and here. They're here. Yes. The fact is they're here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember, I don't know if you know David Jacobs. He does a lot of hypnotherapy work with abductees. And he was asked a question like that. And he was like, you know what? It doesn't matter where they come from. They're here. <laughs> yeah. It's a problem and we have to deal with it. Does it really matter? What planet no. they came? I mean, it was hilarious the way he said that. It really doesn't matter because does does it change the situation? No, it doesn't. We still have to deal with it. It is fun to think about where did they come from, but in the end, it's something we do have to deal with. And I think that in, to close this off, you've done a brilliant job dealing with it. I'm so glad you shared as much as you did. I hope going through this journey of remembering your roots and where you came from and what you did to overcome this and what you accomplished mm -hmm. is something to be commended. And if anybody's at a similar point, not identical, but similar, I'm hoping they will find this talk and they will find your website. They'll find Jerry, they'll find the book. So do you um, have anything else you want to say to end this? Michelle, I really enjoyed this conversation and I hope that it helps a lot of people and I hope that it helps you in your curriculum. You're mm -hmm. on a great path and uh, I commend you for all of your work. That's wonderful. And we're at a period of time, I think, on planet Earth where things are changing rapidly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I see a lot of people waking up to more spiritual awareness. And I think that's a wonderful thing. I, you know, we can see the, the ugliness around us, but hey, there's probably more of us who are waking up than anybody realizes. And I just get that feeling inside that this is a good thing. This is an exciting time to be here, to, to watch all these changes happening and watch the dark side keep pushing and keep pushing and keep pushing. Mm -hmm. And we're like, hey, wait a minute. Yeah. And then as they this push, this pressure, this pressure releases, you know, it releases these mm -hmm. gifts and talents because there has to be a balance. There's always a balance in this reality. We are almost like a patented technology, this human body and the way it functions and operates. And what I talk about in my master's work is that these predators have to follow certain rules and regulations when they come here to interact with us, because this environment has to stay balanced. There's always that balance. Even when we get this dark pressure, this positive stuff comes to the surface through somebody like you, through somebody like Jerry, somebody like me, leaves the corporate world and starts reading books that I can tell you I never would have read in a million years, 20 mm -hmm. years ago. Mm -hmm. That pressure starts to shape people and mold people. So like you said, this is an exciting time. And if any of this resonates with anybody, then look out because you're probably going to go through some kind of alchemical transformation that we just talked about that Sherry went through. I know <laughs> I've gone through it. It's all for the better. And thank you again for taking so much time. I, I think we did three it. hours. We've given people tools on what to do. We've shown them. Self-defense is showing you how to avoid something, how to identify something, and then what to do if you encounter Absolutely. it. And we, that's exactly what we did. I look forward to Sunday talking again. I look forward to it too. Well, thank okay. you very much all again. Right. Thank you. Hold on for a second. I'm just going to hit pause.